First Peter 5, 1 through 7. My goal is to help you, help me harvest the spiritual food that God has provided for each one of us to feast on from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Our overreaching theme for our study in 1 Peter has been Christ, our hope. The biblical meaning of that word hope is Christ, our expectation. He's not just a wish. He's not just a bet we're making. He's our expectation. More specifically, Christ, our expectation of living victoriously through fiery trials and suffering. Remember the command is, consider it all joy, my brethren, if you encounter various trials. Is that what it says? No, it says when you encounter various trials. That's from James chapter one, verse two. Brother James Mirabal, who did not write the book of James, did preach through and from and, and over and under 1 Peter 4.12, which says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Growing up in our expectation, our hope of becoming more Christ, more like Christ, absolutely demands that we know him, that we know his thoughts, his wisdom, his love, his strategies for our warfare against Satan and the sins which seek to kill our joy in Christ. So my goal is to demonstrate for you how you can feed or feast from God's feast that he has prepared for you in his holy word to enable you to feed yourself, to preach to yourself so that, a, that you will be a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Then when you have fed yourself, you will be able to feed others. Again, the, the text that you're, the text that we're going to preach from is 1 Peter 5, 1 through 7. So let's pray and, and get started. Well, Father, your word is, is a gift to us, and it is, they are words that are supernaturally given, they are supernaturally powerful, and they are supernaturally understood, Lord, that without your Holy Spirit within us, we have not a, a starting place to understand the depth of your wisdom. But, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, we have all we need to gain all we need of your wisdom. So I pray, Father, that you will help us, help me, help these to, to feast on this word. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So try not to just read along. Um, we wanna harvest fruit, fruit from, the, from the text. We, when, when I read through a, through a text, I like to, to read it several times. We're not going to do that tonight. But I like to read it several times and, and see what fruit is there that pops out. God's written it for us to feast on. And so he wants us in the garden looking for ripe fruit to eat. So I look for, I look for words. I look for concepts. I look for... To, to try to, to see what food that God has spread before me as a, as a feast. That's when you get things out of the text, we call that exegesis. It's leading things out of the church. You've heard Tim and, and the elders refer to that several times. And since it begins with therefore, at least in my New American Standard, and so in your, East, your English Standard Version, we need to go back to at least one sentence before, before us to explain the, the, the premise, the reason for the passage at hand. So I'm going to start at, at chapter 4, verse 19. 1 Peter 4, 19, 5 through 7. Remember, we are looking for words. We are looking for concepts to harvest and, and feed on and savor 
Christ. So let's start with 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, and on through chapter 5, verse 7. Listen, you're, don't just read along. You're looking for fruit. Because I'm going to ask you what fruit you found. Therefore, let those who also suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Therefore, or so, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, or you younger ones, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, it's written to the church, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Okay, farmers, <laughs> workmen, gourmet chefs looking for a meal, call out some words or concepts that help you describe what the Holy Spirit is thinking about in, in these sentences. Help me. Give me some fruit. Shepherds. Suffering. Partakers. Humility. Doing good. Example. So that's about five or six pieces of fruit. I'm going to take 20 minutes with each one, and we should be. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I never preach that long. In fact, after about 35 minutes, my battery goes down. Um, good. Excellent. Some of the. Here were, here were three words that popped out at me, or phrases, and, and they have to do with everything that you just said. Suffering with, for, or from Christ. Chapter 4, verse 19, chapter 5, verse 1, chapter, and verse 7. Secondly, church leadership, and by extension, Christian leadership, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And Christian or Christ-like humility. Verses 5 through 7. Suffering, leadership, humility. That could be three separate sermons. In fact, you might memorize the verses with each topic to have them handy when you, when you are suffering or when you are considering the value of godly leadership and, and how thankful you are for the elders of our church. Or when dealing with pride, pride in your children, in others, and on rare occasions, maybe a twin-sized microscopic atom of the temptations of pride in yourself. But the Holy Spirit also seems to intend for us to consider connections between suffering and leadership and humility because he has connected them with connecting words. Verse 419, therefore, let those who also, also who suffer according to the will of God Verse five, chapter, or chapter five, verse one, therefore, or so in the ESV, 
therein hitherto vouchsafe in the King James. I, no, I don't know what the King James says. I, I exhort the elders among you, so therefore, verse five, or chapter five, verse five, you younger men, you younger, younger ones, you youth, likewise, be subject to your elders and, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility. In chapter five, verse six, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. I think there's connection there. Suffering. The whole book addresses how to suffer for Christ's glory. The, the gospel is about God's suffering to free us from the consequences of sin. Broken relationship with God, broken relationship with others, physical, emotional pain, living in a sin-loving world that's broken, eternal death of life without God. Since we are born again by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of being conformed to the image of God's Son, we must learn to deal with the suffering that comes upon those who want to live like Jesus in a world that hates the intrusion of his truth and holiness in, in the, into the sin and darkness it prefers. So there's no reason to be surprised or depressed when life hurts as a Christian. We've, we've been talking about that. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, verse uh, 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. It's natural for a person to strike back and take vengeance on enemies. It's supernatural to lay down one's life and be willing to suffer for our enemy in danger. The centurion soldier who directed Jesus' crucifixion heard Jesus respond to mocking and shame and excruciating pain, cross-like pain, where we get the word, with not father snuff them out, not you guys are toast, but father what? Forgive them. And his response, that centurion's response, when he saw the way Jesus suffered was, certainly this is the Son of God. Even in this world, people would agree that money may talk, but suffering preaches. Money may talk, but suffering preaches. So here Peter, writing from a prison cell, believes his, his end is near and wants his most important wisdom to be his last word. So he acknowledges suffering as part of a Christian's hope, a Christian's expectation in Christ. So we shouldn't get discouraged when we encounter it. It's part of the path. You know you're on the path to Christ's glory and his pleasure and his joy. He acknowledges suffering as a part of the Christian hope, the Christian expectation in Christ. Secondly, then he goes on, then Peter goes on into leadership, Christian leadership, primarily church leadership. Talking about elders, he calls them shepherds, poor men. But what is the purpose of leadership? Well, let's do some English. The purpose of leadership is to what? Lead. To lead to what? To lead to live. 
to lead to thrive, to lead to maturity, to lead others. So don't tune out here when we're talking, when you get the idea we're just talking about church leadership. By extension, we had someone mentioned the examples, and he calls the church leadership to be examples for the flock so that they might become more like Christ and know him better. Everyone's not been called to fill church offices, but everyone, every Christian is called to make disciples for Christ at some level through the spiritual leadership, the shepherding of our lives that we provide for our children, for our coworkers, our friends, all whom Jesus the Good Shepherd refers to as what? Sheep. Sheep. Do sheep need a shepherd? So what do you call sheep without a shepherd? Independent? Self-reliant? Strong? Well, you call them lost. Wolves call them dinner. They're hurt. They get hurt. Peter knew what it was like to be a lost and dying sheep until the great shepherd, chief shepherd, came to his rescue. So his goal at the end of his life is still to train shepherds, first in the church, and then by extension those whom the elders lead toward Christian leadership in the world as lights in the world. Therefore I exhort the elders among you, the overseers, the bishops, among you, so remember he's writing to to the church, those elders who are among you, here's a connection between now suffering and leadership, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also with you of the glory to be revealed. Any thoughts on why his description of himself was not as a a successful fishing industry executive or as one of the 12 apostles, better yet as one of the big three, Peter, Jesus, or Peter, James, and John. Remember our our words, our connecting words, suffering, leadership, and what was the third one? Humility. Peter's about to call shepherds, elders, pastors, to shepherd the flock of God. And Peter, has, has Peter ever been told similar words? When? Well, in John chapter 21, the last chapter of the book, we're told that Peter, after the, after the Sunday morning, the empty tomb, after seeing Jesus alive from the dead, after seeing the glorious Lord of, who claimed to be God alive as he said he would, defeating death, Peter's gone back to doing something he knows, the fishing business. Have you you ever done that? I know you have. (laughs) I'm just trying to spark it. God does something great, something glory. You go, wow, that's amazing. And within a week, we can be right back looking for our comfort zone, right back in the regular things of life. You'd almost think we didn't have an encounter with the glorious God. So so we can't get too hard on Peter for kind of going back to his comfort zone because that's the way we all tend to, to flow. So, so, this is after, after the resurrection. Peter's out fishing. They've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Sees a guy on the, on the shore, 
says, hey, you guys might try, you haven't caught anything, have you? So he said, well, you might try throwing it off to the right side of the, net, of the boat. They did so and the fish can't even haul them all in. <laughs> Jesus, or Peter says, it's Jesus. So he strips down, swims to the shore, comes up onto the shoreline, and, and how does Jesus greet him? You self-centered fool. You cowardly ex-apostle. No, he says, hey, come and eat. Come and eat breakfast. Come and feast on me. Our God is always our loving Father, don't forget that. Before, during, and after our spiritual failures, he never stops caring for us. So Jesus says, Peter, do you what? Do you love me? He said it three times. And three times Jesus, Peter said, you know that I love you. And then three times Jesus said what? Feed my sheep. Why did Jesus challenge Peter three times about, about his love for him? You know why, because three times Peter the super apostle denied him three times that he even knew it. Peter was called, we are all called to be the elders, or as, Peter was called as, all, as are all elders, to the body of Christ to shepherd the flock among you as one who has not only failed Christ yourself but also have partaken of the glory to be revealed. You ever wonder what, the, what does that mean, the glory to be revealed? It, what are you, what's the greatest glory that you're going to encounter that God's gonna to reveal to you when you get to heaven? Is it gonna be all the stuff that you wish you had? You know. So you can play big yard, so you can play football. Uh, you know, there's going to be gold line golf courses. Is not the most amazing thing about heaven going to be that you and I are there? Forgiven? That's glory. So now we blend leadership and Christ like. Humility. Shepherd the flock of God among you, he says. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Not because you have to, but because you want to. According to the will of God, you are the fellow servant of God, not their God. Calvin, in looking at these verses, said uh, the three greatest temptations to, to church leadership, and by extension, the three greatest temptations to you and I under their leadership are sloth, laziness, and I'm not talking about the little animal that on Zootopia or whatever that was. It, it, You guys are going to think this sermon's being pre preached by a sloth here in a minute. <laughs> sloth, greed, and lust for power or pride. Sloth, greed, or the lust for power, pride. So he says, exercise the oversight, but not under compulsion, not because nobody else will do it, not because you, you're just forced to out of guilt, but because you want to voluntarily, he says, willingly, wanting to. And he says, not for sordid gain. 
There, there, apparently, there's always been this deal with the health wealth preachers, right? Back then, they had guys that were going around preaching for money, trying to go into women's ho houses and, and disturb their faith and, and take from them and make them codependent. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Yes, pastors are worthy of double honor. Listen, pastors are worthy of double honor, but they aren't to be motivated by it. Now, don't just think of Tim, Clint, and Stephen. Remember, we're talking about where your leadership in your community, in your circle, what are you motivated by? Not to be slothful, not to be greedy, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to their charge. Not masters over my flock, but servants to the flock. Proving to be examples to the flock. You don't do as I say, you do as I do. I wash your feet. You go and do likewise. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will, be re you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is gonna connect to the last appeal for humility on our part. Because when we know what Christ is bringing us, we're not so concerned about what we have now. Because what Christ is bringing us cannot even be compared, Paul says, to, or what we have now cannot even be compared to what Christ has for those who wait for him. You younger men, likewise, you younger ones, you youth, likewise, be subject to your elders and all of you. Now, remember what we're talking about? We've talked about humble leadership, not slothful, not greedy. Not proud. Humble yourselves, therefore, or I'm sorry, back in verse five. Be subject to your elders. Clothe yourselves with humility. He's talking to the whole church towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As much as God talks about humility in the scriptures, for whatever reason, we don't see pride as one of the big Big ones up there with adultery and murder and pornography and everything else, drunkenness. <laughs> it really starts at the top. It was Adam and Eve's biggest sin. Doesn't he want you to be like God? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Not on your time, at the proper time. Who knows best what the proper time is than God? Suffering, leadership by example, and humility. How do we Entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right? Well, first we have to be in Christ so that we may suffer with him, through him, by his power. Suffering, humility, leadership, and humility.
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. How do we address suffering? This says, under the mighty hand of God, in humility before him to say, this is the life, this is the situation that you have given me, God. This is the day, this is the time, this is the moment that you have made. My suffering is not in spite of you, my suffering is designed by you to make me see Christ more perfectly. To see the Christ who walks with me and talks with me. There's a church in Austin called the Austin Stone. It's a Southern Baptist church, I don't know if you've heard about it. They, they have a, a great ministry for telling stories. Riley uh, loves to, he's, he's big on stories. And he, he turned me on, I, and, and I would refer you to this. You can just go to Austin Stone Stories and uh, cue up the one that says the, something about the man with cerebral palsy. Six minute long video about a 43 year old man in Austin who can't feed himself, can't dress himself. It's hard to understand him when he talks. But he says that uh, he loves to go to church in his electric wheelchair. And he's threatened with loneliness sometimes. He sometimes struggles with that because he says he forgets that whatever I want in this world that I feel like I'm missing, listen to what this man says. Jesus is better. This is a man who has put himself, humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. However you made me, God, thank you. And I want to read you one, one sentence from that, from that spot. This is quoting this man. God made me who I am. And I was born with CP, cerebral palsy, not because of an accident, but on purpose. And when I think of on purpose, I say, oh man, how can I not worship God? Because he loved me that much to give me CP, so that I can encourage the whole body of the church. That's a man who has humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. He's leading under the mighty hand of God. He's leading under the mighty hand of God through suffering in glory. Because, and he can cast his suffering upon God because he knows that his God cares for him. And all he wants to do is glorify him for making him who he is. What if that was us every morning, every day, in every moment, saying, this is the day you have made for me, God. Surely I will praise you. And Lord, if I suffer, thank you because suffering is, is what Christ did for me that I may know him and the better I know him, the more I know, the more I suffer, the more I know how much he loves me. So, the connection. Suffering, not by itself, 
suffering designed for leadership, not only in the church, but, in, but for us in the world as shepherds leading lost sheep in humility under the mighty hand of God because think about it whose hand would you rather be under whose hand would you rather be in money may talk but suffering preaches let's pray Father, I'm so convicted by that man's life in, in Austin. Lord, I'm so convicted by the, the lives of men like Peter and, and Paul and men that had every chance to be men of renown and yet they found their greatest strength, their greatest pleasure through whatever suffering they encountered with their Savior. And Lord, as we become conformed into the image of our Savior, may we, Lord, learn to not only endure the suffering that you have designed for our life, but Lord, would you teach us to feast on it? Would you teach us to relish your joy and relish your power and relish your sovereign hand and promise that we will endure? Lord, anybody can understand how someone can prosper for religion. but few can understand how we would be willing to suffer for our Savior. Make me like that, Lord. Make me thankful. Continue, Lord, to feed me whatever suffering it might take that I might feast on the depth of the glories of Christ. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.